Howdy, folks. We're back with another episode of the Urquan Masters HD edition. And we're talking to the Nolan Maid this time at the moment. How y'all doing? If you're watching this on Twitch, uh, not on Twitch, if you're watching on Twitch, hey everybody, if you're watching this on YouTube, we're recording this on Twitch, twitch.tv slash mechagm, and uh, yeah, catch us live, we I play a lot of different games, um, mostly RPGs, but you know. Anywho, uh, yeah, we're talking to the Milner May, and we're going to have them sell us some historical information, since we have got a lot of credits and don't not much else to use it for. Almost 25,000 of your years ago, there existed near this region of space. An association of star-faring races called the Sentient Milieu. This group formed over several thousand years to mutually enrich their respective cultures to provide a safe crash for emerging sentient species mm. and to afford themselves a degree of protection from external hostilities via military alliance. Of the seven most active milieu members, the most famous race, indeed, you know them well, Captain, were the Urquois. Aha! Uh -huh. More historical information! The Urquois evolved on a harsh planet, orbiting a star outside this region of space. They were solitary predators, like your brain mantis captain, or polar bear, who had a very limited set of social behaviors, most of which dealt with sex. Since they had to compete for survival against many physically superior species, the Urquan involved intelligence and tool use in much the same way as your own species. The Urquan also learned to master their fierce territoriality, to build a cooperative planetary culture. When the Urquan were discovered by the Taeo, they had just begun exploring their solar system in crude atomic vehicles. Although the Urquan attacked what <coughs> thought to be an invader, the Taeo were patient. They explained the purpose of the sentient milieu and offered the Urquan membership. The Urquan recognized the benefits that such a system provided and once more conquered the hunting beast within themselves to become cooperative, productive members of the milieu. This lasted for several thousands of years. Ooh. Just over 20,000 years ago, mm. when your ancestors were learning to chart the course of the moon and stars on animal horns, the sentient milieu spanned 500 light years and included the membership of a hundred worlds. Like all other star travelers, they had discovered ruins and relics of a far more ancient culture, which your species calls the Precursors. Explorers from many species spent their lives trying to piece together this ancient mystery, but of all races, the Urquan were the most bold adventurers. Their scouts, flying single ships, penetrated far into uncharted space and landed a million worlds. On one such mission, a young Earth One made planet fall on a small, light-bearing alien world to identify some anomalous energy readings, occasionally a sign of precursor installations. Instead, the Earth One found a small, hideous creature, a Dinyari. Before the scout was able to defend itself, the Dinyari creature took control of the Urquan's mind and commanded the scout to place the Dinyari aboard the Urquan's ship, along with hundreds of its evil brood. Then, the Urquan returned to the heart of the milieu, landing 
on its capital planet. Within hours, every resident of the planet was a Dinyari slave. Within a month, <coughs> Dinyari compelled starships and spread the evil, psychic creatures across the entire milieu. So, yeah. Fuck. When the Dinyari took control of the milieu, one race fought back. The Takeo. These slow, quiet creatures were silicon-based life forms, but bore little resemblance to the modern Chenjesu. Taelo were natural immunes to the Dinyari psychic compulsion. They were unaffected by the creature's power, and the Dinyari would not permit anyone to exist outside their control. So they ordered the remaining races of the milieu to attack and destroy the Taelo home planet. This planet was one of the few milieu worlds located in this region of space. I believe you call their star Delta Vulpecule. Their home was a moon revolving about the second planet. I'm sad to say that the Taero were indeed eliminated. However, at the time of their devastation they had completed a device which they thought would give other races psychic immunity like their own. What happened to this device, this shield? It's hard to say. Maybe it was destroyed in the attack on their home world. Maybe not. Uh, it might be in our cargo hold, actually. Uh, more historical info? In the Dinyare's new empire, the Urquan were the favored slaves. This is probably because the Urquan were the most psychically sensitive, the most easily compelled. As the centuries of Dinyare dominance passed, what was once the sentient milieu deteriorated and degenerated into a great galactic gulag. Alien races which did not serve with the efficiency and speed demanded by the Dinyare were ruthlessly burned from the faces of their worlds. The agents of this genocide were inevitably the Dinyari's favorite pet, the Urquan. Uh -huh. After almost 2,500 years of unrelenting Dinyari control, there were only four living member races of the once great sentient milieu. By this point, the Dinyari had used genetic manipulation to split the Urquan into two subspecies. The green Urquan. Scientists, technicians, and administrators who were responsible for maintaining the limited infrastructure of the Dinyari civilization. And the black Urquan, who filled the ranks of basic laborer and combat soldier. Then, a chance discovery by an Urquan named Kazerza led to the violent overthrow of the Dinyare slave empire. So we've heard bits and pieces of what, what led to the overthrow of the Dinyare. We're now going to get the actual excruciating details of it. The Urquan named Kazertza was a green, a researcher specializing in repairing the mental damage inflicted by long-term exposure to the Dinyare's psychic compulsion. By this point in history, the Dinyare had grown lax in their dominance, and on occasion, 
accidentally committed their slaves moments of self-direction. Gazette Zaha was able to use those few scattered minutes to compose a theory. From its observations, Gazette Zaha realized that when a slave died, the Dinyare disconnected from the slave's mind, lest it too be dragged down to death. Further, the Irkwan scientist uncovered the fact that when a slave underwent great pain, the Dinyare temporarily disconnected. But that the degree of pain had to be extreme, nearly lethal. Kazerza chose its moment carefully. It waited until it was near an open transmission unit. Then, in a short moment of mental freedom, the Urquan injected itself with a dose of acidic poison, sending incredible waves of pain through its long body. In the few moments before its death, Kazerza was able to wrest control of the transmitter to send word of its discovery across the planet and into space as well. Before the Dinyare knew what was happening, Urquan everywhere were hacking at their own bodies with chunks of glass, burning themselves horribly, doing anything that would give them the few seconds of freedom necessary to find the nearest Dinyari and crush the bleeding creature. As they gained longer and longer periods of control, the Urquan developed new tools and weapons to destroy their evil masters. The most gruesome of these devices was the excruciator, a mechanism which was inserted directly into the brain and generated a constant stream of agony. The Dinyari could not bring themselves to make the necessary mental connection with these tortured Urquan. They were slaughtered by the thousands. The Urquan slave revolt was one. The tragedy of the Urquan is one of those one of the be- one of the most just oh god. Like seriously. <laughs> oh. When the last oh. Urquan was free of psychic compulsion, when the last free Dinyare was dead. The combined might of the Urquan Starfleets met in orbit above the Dinyari homeworld. They had come together to make two important decisions. First, how to punish the few frightened Dinyari left below on the planet's surface. Second, how to ensure that never again would the Urquan be made slaves. Uh huh. The first decision was made swiftly. The Dinyari would not be allowed to die. Ah, that was too kind of fate. Instead, the creatures would be genetically modified into some sentience. They would become dumb animals. These low creatures would be further debased by serving the Urquan for all eternity in the most demeaning way the Urquan could imagine, acting as translators, making physical contact with other species, whom the Urquan now considered grossly inferior to themselves and revolting. The second decision, how to ensure their freedom permanently, caused great turmoil. Oof. Following the successful Urquan slave revolt, the Urquan met to decide <laughs> how to ensure their freedom. 
the green Urquan, who called themselves the Khazar Tsar in honor of the Urquan who triggered the revolt, who wished to establish the path of now and forever, which required that all other sentient species must become slaves of the Urquan or be forever imprisoned beneath an impenetrable force shield. Leading the opposition to this plan was Kora, a charismatic fleet officer. Kora proposed a simpler alternative, the Eternal Doctrine. Simply put, this scheme called for the systematic eradication of all sentient life in the universe, aside from the Iroquois. The captain, if these positions seem to you extreme or unwarranted, you must remember that the Urquan had been unwilling slaves for millennia, and that each of them had to remain in agony for years. Oh, you know, yeah, I, yeah. defeat the Dinyari. The followers of Khazet and Kora were all on the brink of madness. But neither side would submit, and so they fought a bloody civil war. This is the last historical item we have for sale. The civil war between the Green Urquan, the followers of Khazet and their opponents, the death dealing Kora, lasted for decades. Yeah, I can imagine. It's likely that they would have annihilated each other were it not for a chance discovery by Kazertsa, a precursor battleship. The vessel was huge, many times the size of the Urquan's vessels. The precursor ship sliced through the Kora forces in days. The Kora were defeated. However, in their victory, the Kazertsa were humble. They realized that there was a chance that they were wrong, and the Kora were right. Instead of destroying the Kora, the Kazertsa let them go, directing them to make their way through the stars, traveling against the spin of the galaxy. The Kazertsa would travel in the opposite direction, and when the two Urquan forces met, they would fight again in ritual combat, with the precursor battleship given to the winner. Captain, this is happening here and now. The Kazets are the Urquan who enslaved her, are fighting their ritual battle against the Kora in a large area centered near the Craterous constellation. Uh -huh. If the Kora win this battle, Captain, the Kazertsa will stand aside and let them kill us all. We believe it is your destiny to prevent this from happening. Oh, no pressure, huh? We regret to say that you have exhausted our supply of genuinely valuable information. Uh -huh. However, we do have many thousands of useless facts, and that we will gladly sell you at a substantial discount. Are you interested? Hmm, we thought not. Yep, I'll buy some fuel. How much fuel do you wish to purchase? Just fill us up. Fuel transferred to your... Like, we're never going to have fuel issues again. It has been... A pleasure dealing with you, Captain. We look forward to your next visit. Mm -hmm. I think there's something here at Alpha Apodos, but I'm not sure. Like, the Druge mentioned something about Alpha Apodos, that's why I came here. And beyond the Milner Ray here, we'll take a look. I 
I mean, this might just be, I think Alpha Potus might just be the planet where you get the, the, the Urquan uh, Dreadnought thing. I mean, there's gold here we can go grab. Oh, might as well. It's very hot here, though. Oof. Yeah, that planet's just not worth harvesting. It's worth it was worth coming down once to try it, but yeah. What the POTUS? I don't. They mentioned it. They the the Druids did mention this, so like the system is gonna be like like nothing here is gonna be safe to land on. So I'm looking for something of, of note. There might not be anything here, like, it may just be a bit, a bit of fluff. This is one of the ones I keep meaning to check out, I, I don't, and I have checked it out in the past, I just don't remember what it was. I think we checked this one already, on the way in. There might be nothing here. Like, there legit just might be nothing here. <laughs> yeah. One more planet to check, and then we're leaving. Nope, nothing. All right. That's fine. I mean, I worst case, we got to talk to the Milner May, so it's not a, not a big deal. All right, let's go back to Earth. I think it's that portal. Yep. Go have the Starbase Commander scan our stuff. We should have had them scan the Bravixis caster that I'm thinking about it, but whatever. I think they have something interesting to say about it. I forget what, though. Hello, Captain. Before we go on, I have something important to tell you. This seems strange to me, and I considered not bringing it up, but not long ago, six of my people fell unconscious simultaneously for no apparent reason. When they awoke hours later, they reported being overwhelmed by a feeling of something very wrong that had taken place. The med techs couldn't find anything wrong with these crew members, but they discovered one correlation. All six of them have exceptionally high Esper ratings. Huh, interesting. Un momento. All right. And uh, yeah, let's uh, offload minerals. More fuel for the fire, eh, Captain? That last load should keep it blazing. The analysis reads as follows. Subject, rosy sphere device. Data, the specimen is five centimeters in diameter. 
perfectly smooth and composed of a blood red translucent substance. Tests show that it has atypical ferromagnetic properties but is utterly non-conductive. Summary, probably a precursor tool. Function, unknown. The next entry in the analysis is Subject Aqua Helix Device. Data, this device is composed of a light blue super hard substance which rates Mohs 13. The object is composed of a flat ribbon of homogeneous material approximately one meter in length and it is twisted in a perfect helix. Focused ion and <coughs> nucleomagnetic scans reveal little about its interior. Summary, unknown design, unknown origin, unknown function. Uh, Duane, That's the end of our scientist report. Uh, that is tied to the uh, Pakunk disappearing. Um... Nominally speaking, it's not like a big deal. Like in, in our game, it's not a big deal, but it's like they did not separate the Pukunk disappearing safely and the Pukunk disappearing not safely, basically. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. I want to see something. I want this thing. I want to check here. I've, I've. It's been a while since I've tried this. I don't remember if there's they've got special dialog for partially, the partially repaired or Ultron. Captain, the analysis reads as follows: Subject, Ultron device. Data. First, we thought this was a piece of junk. In fact, it may still be just that. But when you submitted it to us, we infused it with gamma radiation and found that the scatter signature was identical to the patterns recorded from the empties, the singing hoops and the big dud, which were all found in precursor burrows on Procyon. Summary. We are now convinced that this is a precursor tool, but it remains dysfunctional. That's the end of our scientist's report. So I'm going to have him scan it each time I partially repair the, the Ultron. It's been a little while since I, I thought I remembered them having bits of that from one of my playthroughs ages ago, but I haven't done it on stream, so... The analysis reads as follows. Subject, Ultron device. Data, the Ultron is partially functional and we can detect energy emission from the device. We suspect that the unit requires additional minor repairs before achieving full functionality. And at this time, we cannot make an assessment of its capabilities. Summary, a single additional replacement part should bring the Ultron to life. That's the end of our scientist's report. <laughs> yes, Bring yes, back Duane. Lots of minerals, Captain. <laughs> and now the fully repaired Ultron. Greetings, Captain. I'm ready to assist you. The analysis reads as follows. Subject, Ultron. Data, we have determined that the so-called Ultron is, in fact, the appendages of Dawn, described in the precursor fragment found on Rigel in 2123. In the partially translated precursor text, the device is described as a mental amplifier which focuses mental energies of the holder for the purpose of discrete change. Unfortunately, human brain emanations do not seem compatible with the Ultron, nor do those of the allied species we have tested. Summary, perhaps the Utwig who claimed to understand this device can shed some light on its true function and power. That's the end of our scientist's report. Try to avoid getting gruesomely killed, Captain. So yes, the fully functional Ultron is in fact a precursor artifact, a like an actual powerful precursor artifact. All right, we're gonna go deliver this to the, Ur the, Ut the Utwig. Still can't use it, but you know. All right, let me double check. 
check this. Nearest is to Supox Base, so five thirty by five twenty eight. <laughs> They're gonna be pleasantly killed. <laughs> I wanna check something here. Let's go talk to the Udwig. And at some point, I actually want to go back and talk to this Silandro. I want to see if they've got anything to say after we've uh, been culling the probes for a while with the, with the destruction code. They've not really seen many of the, the probes recently, so... I forget if they have anything else to say at that point. Yes, I've, I've, got, the, I've, got, the, I've got the Dinyari, yeah. Just go away. Leave us to ponder our grief. Hey guys, guess what we've got? We've got the Ultron! Wanna see it? Ah, should I set my gaze upon such a sight? I might suffer sleepless nights for years on end. It is a symbol of the collective Otwig failure. It is our ultimate tragedy. Ah! Every if it's every crack on its surface is etched forever in my soul. Remove it from my sight, lest I purge my... Hey, that is not the devastated Ultron. It is the image of the Ultron before. A trick. A trick! Oh, I had no idea that any species could sink so low. How dare you try to manipulate me with that cheap stage prop. Why, it's not even... Hey, wait a second. It looks like... Can it be? Yes, it is a miracle. Oh, happy day. Joyous occasion. You have our eternal thanks, good captain. You will be immortalized as the blessed figure that delivered unto us our future. We will revere your very likeness. Let me take the Ultron. Yes, I feel the link, <laughs> the knowledge, and the power. Hmm, it seems that there is much to do. Is there? Indeed. It seems that you should proceed to the second moon of the sixth planet of Zeta Hyades and take what you find there. We no longer have need for it. But the Ultron reveals that you will. I thank you for your part in the grand scheme. We now recover that which is ours via destiny and proceed to perform our essential service for the universe. But wait! The Ultron throbs and whistles. Matters of significance are being relayed to our brains. Oh, it has been so long since we communicated with the Ultimate in such a manner. But slowly, <laughs> the truth is revealed. Our destiny. We have been directed to join with our Supox allies and attack you! No, wait, that's wrong. Sorry. <laughs> well, good. Attack your enemies. The Urquan and the Kura. No, that's not quite right either. What? Oh, okay. We must strike only the black ships, only the Kura. In addition, we will grant you the boon of our Jugger Starship designs as well as a supply of trained starship commanders. Our juggers are nigh invincible. 
I can also say with certainty that our allies, the Supox, will give you the same assistance. Together, we shall defeat the Core R, or at least provide you with a few more months to find a more permanent solution. Now, Captain, we must leave to prepare our battle fates. Wish us luck. So yeah, that's some a little just bit of dialogue that didn't get included in the original game that really, really should have been there. <laughs> Suddenly, I'm overcome with Did not mean to talk up again, but sure. I possess the distinguished honor of addressing the legendary sure. Earth Captain. Please excuse my lack of proper facial appliance. This occasion ideally calls me to don the expression of ultimate gratitude. Eesh. I am compelled by the four solemnations of the Ultron to describe the appearance of the mask. Its foundation is composed entirely of a matrix of beetle secretions and fern in an intricate and complex texture. The process is extremely time-consuming, since even the best-trained beetle colonies will produce a thousand rejects for every successful foundation. Alas, it will be many years before any of the Epic will be able to wear such a mask. Ah. We are pleased that we're of assistance with the recovery of your Ultron. Indeed, we are in the process of reacclimating our brains to its meta wave gyrations. Even now, we are compelled to implement a plan of interference, thwarting the goals of the Kora. We sense, through the influence of the Ultron, that these creatures of evil have goals which are mutually exclusive with our existence and your own. I mean, yeah. Even now, aided by the intangible guidance of the Ultron, we formulate a plan that will serve to preserve the diversity in the galaxy. We prepare an armada composed of the collective might of both the Utwig and Supok's forces that will pursue the invaders with the intent of foiling their plan of doom. Does the Rockle device consider to us a potential course of action? I'm curious actually see what this is. Your request is within our capabilities. One moment. Hmm. Emanations from the Elton. Orange, furry air breathes tender yawns. Yes, it all becomes clear now. You must do something with the Great Bomb. The precursor relic we kept at Zeta Hayati 6B. It seems that this bomb must be, uh, eaten? No. Hugged? No. Ah, improved. That's it. The bomb must be improved to fulfill its final destiny. Prepare and test an air of glory for the Farewell. There is much for us to do. May the Eltron be with you. Oh, yeah, you know, seriously, the Utwig ships are actually terrifying. They are among the best ships in the game. I'm not particularly good with them. Because I'm out of practice, but like they are legit. Ri no, not Ada. Their ships are bordering, if flown right, their ships are bordering on nine vulnerable. It's, oh God. So their special ability is a shield. Okay, so their main gun, fire, it basically they fire these six little shots out of the front of their ship, each doing one point of damage. Uh, and uh, each, so, but their gun chews up no power. But it, they can't run it and they're special at the same time. Their special is a shield that cause power, but while it's up, their ship doesn't generally, doesn't regenerate power naturally is the big thing. Uh, their shield when up, uh, makes the ship invulnerable, but it chews up power, but they, and they can't shoot while doing that. Um, but when they take damage from a weapon while their shield's up, it refills their battery. So timed right, their ships are invulnerable. And the, the, the Supox are probably the best small ship in the game. Flown right again. Uh, their special basically enables them to uh, become inertialess and uh, be able to, instead of turning or thrusting or what have you, while you're holding the special, you can side slip with, with momentum or just go directly backwards. It's ridiculous. And their guns have very high rate of fire and she's a very little power. It, oh God, their guns are really good. But yes, the 
Supox and the combined Supox and uh, cor- and er, ooh, more bio. We'll grab it. Sure, what the hell? And uh, the combined force of the Supox and the Utwig are enough to hold off the Korov for like multiple months. I think they like they add like six turns to the Doom Clock. That's six turns, six months. It's a long time. They had a lot of time for the Doom Clock. Like seriously, if the if the Cora, if the Utwig had more ships, they are and their ships are like the Korra's weapons are easy enough to predict that you can actually like actually time it's actually not that hard to time the time the uh time your shielding on them enemies who fire like single slow shots or slow shots in like you know not not high rate of fire the Udwig are really good against the Udwig are not particularly good against the Urquanbies of the fighters unfortunately they aren't really fast enough to keep away from the fighters their big flaw against the Urquan. Which means the fighters just pick them apart and if they ever drop their shield, they get eaten alive by the fighters. It's unfortunate. Which is why they go after the Korra and not the Urquan. And they can beat the Urquan, it's just that's the it's a rough matchup for them as opposed to the uh Damn, they've got this this system's got a lot of resources. Damn. Multiple treasure worlds? Hmm. I mean, I don't need to do this, but, like, it's habit. I legitimately don't need the resources at this point in the game. I can generate nearly infinite re uh, RU just by buying buying fuel from the, uh, from the, uh, but I'll demonstrate that in a bit at some point. I might demonstrate that at some point. Basically, buying a bunch of fuel from the, uh, the Milner May and then selling it back at the Starbase. Like, in theory, I've got about 3,000 RU worth of... Uh, about 3,000 uh, cre credits, right? 3,000 times, and it's 20 RU per credit. Basically, my credits is roughly equal to 60,000 RU. I currently have, like... I've got a bunch of RU, so I'm like, I don't need to do it, but... You can make a truckload of RU just by buying fuel from the Melon Array and selling it back to selling it off to the uh, selling it at the Starbase. I don't really need to be checking these, but I, I just feel like I just feels like I should. It's a habit. Bio, sure, we'll go grab the bio data, whatever. I would say that the Chimur Avatar is probably still the most powerful all-around all ship in the game. It's got some bad matchups, but other than that, it's ridiculously powerful. Overshot. This is Planet 8, so we gotta find the Planet 6. More bio, we'll grab it. Again, I don't need to, but it's like one of those, I just feel like I should.
Those big blue blue bobs blobs in the non-HD version are worth a lot more. I don't remember. I don't know why they changed it in this one. They also took longer to take down, if my memory serves me correctly. be worth like 10 or something like that uh, bio data but my memory might be wrong on that so yeah, planet 6 is that gas giant <clears throat> yep right, let's scan B for A we'll scan A first just to nothing alright And now comes... Yep. Fancy meeting you here, Captain. Dirge Starship Captain, justify your presence here. We, the appointed representatives of the Crimson Corporation, merely come to obtain the fair and reasonable payment for our goods. We traveled to this region of space years ago to sell the useless Ultron device to the Ootwig. We knew even then of the weapon on the surface below us. This was to be our price. Uh-huh. But the Ootwig used a clever ploy to cheat us. Uh-huh. I had convinced the morose Ootwig fools that the Ultron was the answer to all of their pitiful dreams. Okay. Powers. The Proctor's wine. Will it give us the powers we crave? I assured them that, yes, the Ultron would give them the second sight. The Ultron would allow them to see into the past and the future. The Ultron would slowly imbue each of them with unique secret powers of great significance. Uh -huh. The Ultron would ensure that their race's huge potential for greatness would be fulfilled. Then, then a mistake was made. Enough foolishness. We will take the precursor device from the surface, and then leave. Thereafter, I may see fit to bequeath the entire planet to you, Captain, for your invaluable services in the past, provided you leave now. This pre charge does not belong to you, it is rightfully ours to stand aside. It is we who are the genuine owners, not you, Captain. Those many years ago, when we offered the Ultron to the Ukwe, how they capered and laughed at their good fortune. Fools. Then they begged to hold the device just for a moment. To close the deal, I permitted this. A grievous mistake. The moment the High Proctor touched the Ultron, her body arched and her eyes rolled back in her head. She began to babble meaningless phrases and howl like a beast. We had expected the Ootwig to fall for our cell, to buy the useless device, but never with such gusto. Uh -huh. Their self-doubt and lack of clear reason left them vulnerable to our every uh huh. But then, the Proctor's body relaxed, and her eyes slowly closed. When they reopened, her visual orbs shone with a wild and frightening light. This is all we could have dreamed of, and more, she intoned. And now, Drew, as to your price. I opened my mouth to speak, but before I could utter a word, the Proctor interrupted. Wait! The Ultron feeds your thoughts directly to me! Do not speak! I know what you desire! What could I say? That the Ultron was a farce and could do no such thing? I was stunned and silent. The Proctor continued. The intrusion of the Crimson Corporation desire an object of great antiquity, something of secret function and value. Very well, it shall be done. 
And with that, we were led to a small vault. The proctor ceremoniously opened the door of the vault and explained that because we had been of such great service, all of the treasures within were now ours. Inside we found a hodgepodge of ancient and useless artifacts, a glowing rod, an absurd trident, and more such junk. I could see no way to salvage the disastrous situation at that time. But when I heard of you, your travels, and your foolish quest for freedom, trying to keep a straight I face, trying to keep a straight face, could be the agent of our justice. And lo, it is so. You have heard our justification. It is valid and unassailable. Now go and do not return. It sounds like you were actually paid and you accepted the price. You made the deal, Captain. Uh, regardless of your feelings matter, we'll be taking it because um Yeah, you paid a price. You, you you took payment. You could have said no. Just saying. No, you will not. Oh, are you gonna stop us? We know your soul, young. Captain, it is no brighter than ours. We acknowledge our greed. We revel in it. You are the dishonest one, hiding your shame in shadows. You fabricate justifications, rationales. In the end, we are just You see, no, we're safe. not. But now you stand in our way. You will not be moved. Therefore, we will add your true name to our ledger of hatred. But first, die, child, die! Okay, well, and now... Captain Adama! And now, now, my friends, you get to witness the matchup. The matchup of glory. One Earth Cruiser just wiped out five Druge Maulers. <laughs> the Druge Mauler's not very good, admittedly, but... <laughs> We're above the surface. We found a huge precursor device in the planet's surface. A giant black cylinder set within a simple defensive grid. We've already neutralized the grid. Well, actually, Jenkins just drove through it by accident, but that seemed to work. 
The artifact is covered with precursor script, and although we can't translate all of the writing, it's pretty clear that it is a warning, repeated again and again. The energy output of this artifact is scary. It rivals all our ship's engines at Redline. If I may be so bold, Captain, uh, I would advise that we not experiment with this device until we are back at Earth Star at Starbase. We should now return to the ship with the black cylinder device carefully stowed at the cargo area. End of report. <laughs> so yes, the Earth Cruiser is not one of the best ships in the game. And it clowns the Druge Mauler. But, like, that actually shows off what the Earth ship is actually good at. Alright, we're gonna go to Beta Libre. That's. I just wanna see if there are any soup. If there, I wanna see if I can talk to the soup box briefly. Yep, good. There's the suit box. I just want to chat with the suit box briefly. Hi. Let's see what they have to say after we return the Ultron. I forget. Hello, fellow warriors. We go to uproot our enemies. So what are you doing? Our Utwig allies have instructed us to prepare for combat. And so we make ready. Our destination is Antares where we shall face the Kora in battle. We must defer to the Utwig, who have superior knowledge of such things. They specifically instructed us to inform you that you should not endanger yourself by joining us in this battle. Aha! Your destiny lies along a more subtle, though crucial course. Goodbye, plant dudes. Wish us luck, human. Good luck, plants. I love the soup box. I like the soup box a lot. They're neat. All right, we're going to go back to Earth and have them invest uh, investigate the device, and then we're going to go talk to the um, the Sirene. Doop -a doop 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 doo. That's cool, Duwani. I keep meaning to play the Pathfinder video games. I just haven't had the the time or the energy to play an, an isometric RPG in a while. Welcome back, Captain. I know you're busy, but I've got some news. A race of plant creatures called the Supox have arrived in your absence, Captain. They offered use of their ship designs and will supply you as many starship captains as we require. I, of course, accepted their offer immediately. Also, a small contingent of Utwig has visited. After spending a few days setting up our fabricators to build their jugger starships and providing us with a few capable commanders, they departed. Captain, if you continue to build such strong alliances, we will surely win our battle against the Urquan. All right. Good work, Captain. The analysis reads as follows. Subject, Utwood Bomb Device. Data, analysis has yield little information about this device, largely because of our technician's unwillingness to open it or even <laughs> remove the bomb from your ship. That aside, here's what we know so far. The device is correctly defined as a bomb, one of enormous destructive potential, but it's not of Utwig origin. 
Nothing about it relates to the technology we see in the Jugger ship. We believe it to be of late precursor origin, though it somewhat resembles certain Chenjesu technology. Its original function? Probably a planeteering tool for dispersing unwanted moons. Summary? Unless there's a strong reason to do otherwise, do not activate this device. Leave it alone. Any experimentation should be conducted at least 12 astronomical units from this starbase, and preferably a bit further. <laughs> That's the end of our scientist's report. All right. Farewell, Captain. Yes, unwanted moons. All right. I'm going to clear out a few ships here. I'm going to clear out as much as I don't want to. I don't need all four of the Spathy ships. I'll keep three. And uh, I'll hang on to one Arlu ship. Uh, don't want to hang on to an Earth Cruiser. Yeah, I'll hang on to one Earth Cruiser. And one Kong ship. And then we're going to build a pair of Utwig Juggers and a pair of Supox Blades. I can still build Third Ash torches. That's hilarious. Honestly, I might build one. Um, nah, I think we're good. Ah, I'm tempted, actually. The Thredash... The Thredash Torch is a... The reason I'm thinking of building the Thredash Torch is it breaks the AI on a lot of ships. They don't realize that the... The AI doesn't seem to realize that the trail the Thredash leaves behind does damage and will just fly into it. I decided, you know what? Screw it. Anyways, folks, that's going to do it for this part for YouTube. I'm going to record one more part today, and uh, yeah. Thank you for watching, everybody. Hope you enjoyed. Next part, we're going to be going to go talk to the Siren. Yeah, I got time for one more part, I think. Mm. Mm. I want to record one more part. But I also have to make dinner. Um, I unfortunately got started streaming too late today. Um, so I don't have a lot of time. I have to make dinner to, at some point. <sighs> well, either way, YouTube, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed. We'll be back soon with more Star Control 2. Not positive exactly when that'll be, but thank you for watching. See you soon. Take care. Have a great time. If you liked it, like, share, subscribe, comment, all that jazz, and come visit me on, on Twitch, twitch.tv slash If you enjoyed the stuff. Bye-bye.